All right, we are live. Welcome to today's live stream, everybody tuning in. I see we have a few people already in the chat. Matty S, Elliot Drinks Water, Dirk is here, and uh, Yalu Pookie too. Bruce only has three pieces, and we know them. That's a pretty good point. You guys can see here, let me uh, maximize this. I've actually got four pieces in front of the camera today that we will be talking about as well as a few other things. So I just want to welcome you guys to tonight's live stream. I'm glad you're here. If you have any questions or comments, um, and, and it doesn't have to be related necessarily to the watches on screen, go ahead and, and shout them out in the chat. I'm happy to interact with you guys and have a conversation. So I appreciate you being here this uh, Sunday evening as we kind of talk watches. So let me start start by moving a few things here and I'll show you a watch that I have. <laughs> this is my oldest watch and this is the Seiko, excuse me, Seiko chronometer. This was a gift from a friend of mine. It is a sub seconds mechanical hand winding tiny little Seiko with a bubble crystal uh, acrylic crystal. And uh, just a good friend of mine gave this to me because he, he knows that I love Seiko. So <laughs> that was really nice of him. It needs a service. It's far too small for me to wear. I mean, you can see how small it is next to my big old paw right here. <laughs> so I couldn't wear it and my wife is not interested in wearing it. And maybe one day my daughters, one of them will show some interest in this vintage Seiko. Uh, Malkin Malone is in the comments. Tennessee Mike. Hello, Tennessee Mike. Phil is here. Stan is here. Good to see you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so that is part of my collection, though it's kind of a sentimental piece that doesn't get worn. Now, let me show you something else that's kind of funny. I'm, I'm actually wearing it. So let me take it off wrist, place it in front of the camera. <laughs> Do you guys see this? Fake Rolex. Hey, hey, one second here. Mike says that's a beautiful Seiko. Mike is my friend that gave me the Seiko. So thank you, Mike. That's cool to see you here. <laughs> I didn't know you'd be here in the stream. Uh, yeah, Mike gave me that Seiko. Uh, okay, so going back to this ugly fake Rolex, what is the deal be behind this? I mean, look, the crown doesn't well, maybe the crown moves. The crown moves a little bit. <laughs> there is no movement. There's, it's totally fake. So what is the deal? Bruce, why do you got this? Well, you know what? My grandfather who passed away several years ago went to a kind of a, what do they call it? It's a gag gift exchange, white elephant Christmas exchange, something like that with his coworkers and he took home this, you know, $10 fake Rolex. And I don't know why he didn't throw it away. He wasn't into watches, but after he passed on, it was found in his, just his items, his things, his possessions. And, um, my fam a family member gave it to me because they knew I loved watches. So I can never wear this, <laughs> but I've got a fake Rolex that belonged to my grandfather one day. Yeah, Folex, Folex, Valen Gray Moon says. So, hey, it's good to see you guys. Mike F's in the house. Jeffrey Deitschler is here. Ken Spear is here. Uh, Vincent Champion, Adidas 76, Kurt Hevgold from Australia, Jesper Vissing. Really nice. Uh, really nice to see you guys here. Mike has a comment that says, My stepdad had a fake president he bought maybe in San Juan, maybe the 70s. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of funny. So, you know what? I'm going to take this ugly old thing and put it on wrist so we can talk about the real watches. Um, actually, let me show you one other thing. If I can get it, if I can get it uh, in frame here. This is a Seiko that I will never sell. It is a really cool gold-plated quartz desk clock that runs on a uh, AA battery, skeletonized. And it's such a cool piece. So here's kind of the main view of it. But I, I have it here just on the desk. And uh, that is like my my uh, secondary items things. But let's, let's go to the real watches that I want to talk about today. 
And a Zodiac has a question. Have you looked into doing the adjustable class upgrade mod on your speedy? No, I haven't Zodiac because I'm, I might get the updated speed master and I want to see what exactly, what exactly the bracelet looks like. I know it's going to have a very nice taper. I like the changes, you know, from the movement aspect alone. I like the squat function pushers, the little bit simpler index track on the dial, but I wanted to see what the clasp looks like. So I'm holding off on doing any type of upgrade mod to see what the new version is going to be like. And I'm hearing from a couple contacts that I have that, that work at authorized dealers that that Speedmaster could be available for sale as early as next month. So we'll see where that goes. And here's another question. Anonymous says, where do I buy nice desk clocks? I bought mine from a local shop here in Salt Lake City that, that my watchmaker runs. And he... He had a really nice JLC Atmos. Here, let me switch perspectives here uh, just for a second. He had a really nice JLC Atmos that I wanted, but uh, he sold it before I you know, got my funds in order. It's about $1,000, but that is a desk clock that I would love to add one day. Uh, the Seiko that I showed you, again, let me kind of pull it up in front of the camera. I think I paid like $30 for this. It was very affordable. And man, is it cool. So um, you can get some good stuff and you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, Mike says he got a cool Le Coutre alarm on eBay. So I don't know that I don't know that a lot of brands make current desk clocks. You know, a lot of a lot of the best deals are going to be pre-owned. Phil put a tip here, five pounds or euros, excuse me. Hey Bruce, I bought the white dial Seamaster 300 after your review of the black dial and love it. Phil, that's awesome, man. Way to go with getting what's probably the best luxury or entry-level luxury watch out there in terms of bang for buck. I mean, it's such a solid watch all the way around, uh, even down to the wood presentation box. So <laughs> that's awesome. And I appreciate the tip. That is, uh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. So let's go back, excuse me, let's go back to the watch collection here. And let me start with my least expensive watch, which is my most recent purchase. Uh, this is the SPB 187. I've got a review dropping on this, I think, tomorrow here on the channel. It should be ready to upload. And you know what? It's a really fun watch, but it is a classic Seiko, meaning the bezel kind of sucks when it comes to the action. The alignment is just a hair off. And also, surprisingly, the loom isn't the best on this version here. Uh, it's thinly printed. It's not deep filled like some of the other offerings out there. So this is not a keeper. In fact, I wouldn't say any of these are really keepers. I don't use the K word. I've learned over the years. I can't use that word because I don't keep watches. I love trying different watches. That being said, though, I'm not going to be moving on from kind of the jewels of my collection for I don't know how long, but, um, but yeah, this one is definitely not sticking around. Maybe I sell it soon. Maybe I trade it. Um, I'm enjoying it, but it's, it's definitely not exciting enough to stay in the collection long-term. So, uh, let's go to the comments here. I, I definitely want to interact with you guys. Jim says 2021 prediction, Bruce rebuys the blue and silver Seamaster. You know, you're not far off because I have a section here and let me, let me bring this. Uh, oh no, I don't, I didn't prepare it. Uh, scratch that. Uh, I, when it comes to future plans, I definitely want to add an Omega diver again because I did sacrifice the Seamaster when I bought this lovely overseas from VC. And there are two that really have my eye. And one of them is the white dial planet ocean with the ceramic bezel that's loomed. That thing is so nice. I reviewed one in the summertime and it was just a million bucks. It was so nice. And Dirk, if you're still here, I know Dirk has one in his collection. I'm not sure if he's still tuned in, uh, but it, yeah, it's a lovely watch. I'd maybe do that or I've heard, and this has not been confirmed yet, that Omega will be updating the Seamaster 300. Not the Seamaster Professional 300, but the classic Seamaster 300 that has like the three 
the the six, the nine, and the twelve. Uh, that was known as the Bond watch. Um, which Bond film was it? I can't remember exactly. Uh, but that one is rumored to be updated this year. And if they do that, and I've <laughs> I've seen some renders, I've seen some inside information. Um, if that happens. I might be wanting to get one of those because I think the changes look really, really good. So yeah, I, I definitely want an Omega Diver. I'm not sure which one exactly, but I'm sure in 2021 something will happen. So you know me pretty well, Jim Scott uh, 306. So let, let's shout out a couple more people tuning in. Jared says, love the channel and the content. Bruce, happy new year. Stay safe, everyone. Really nice comment. Thank you, Jared. Hope you guys had a great Christmas. I hope you have an excellent New Year's uh, full of prosperity and health. And I, I hope that 2021 is a heck of a lot better than 2020 has been for a lot of people. So great comment, Jared. Michael says, I have the Oris Aquas and the Tag Heuer Aqua Racer, but I don't wear them much. What's a good choice if I flip them both for just one watch? Well, it depends on which ones you have, Michael. I I'm assuming you can get around a thousand for your Aquas, and then probably, uh, probably around a thousand for the Tag Warrior on the low end. I'm just assuming it's not perfect condition, and I'm not sure which ones you have. But I'm assuming you've got two thousand. Maybe you can add a little bit to that budget. What would I suggest for the mid twos? Monta Ocean King, really nice. Um, if, if you're okay with like an independent, lesser known brand. Um, and okay, here's, here's another suggestion and it's not a dive watch. Tell me if you need a dive watch, but the Tudor Royal that just came out, I think that's great value and they're right around $2,000 if you're getting steel and they're about $3,000 if you want to get the buy tone or the, or the, uh, the two tone that has some precious metal and the bezel in the crown and a capped um, link system in the bracelet. So I think that's a heck of a buy. The big eye navigation chronograph from Longines is a heck of a buy at around 2000. So that's what I would suggest for you, Michael. And if anybody else has suggestions, please put them in, in the chat. I'd, uh, I'd love to hear those. Okay. Let me keep, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep up with these comments here. <laughs> There's so many good questions. Um, Brian says you need a G shock in the collection as well, Bruce, that blacked out square you had needs to come back. You know, if I were to buy a G shock, I'm really intrigued by the titanium camo square, but in that olive tone, not the blue one, I think, man, that would be a wonderful watch. They're just so dang expensive. And I know that sounds silly because the watches in my collection, you know, the cheapest one is a thousand dollars, but for a G-Shock, for a digital watch, that's steep, but it's the one I like the most. But I agree, I, I do, I should have a G-Shock in the collection. Raphael says, have you thought about getting a gold watch? And I have. <laughs> I don't know if you were here earlier, Raphael, when I uh, when I showed you this, showed you guys this fake gold Rolex. Um, this was a gag gift that my grandfather got. Excuse me, but yes, I think maybe on down the road after I've had a lot of fun playing with wonderful watches from Omega and Rolex, Vacheron, maybe Audi Mar Piguet. I'd love to get something precious metal. Maybe when I'm closer to retirement, I'd love to try a Longa one. I'd love maybe even an, you know, an authentic <laughs> day date from Rolex in yellow gold. I think the red hue of the gold, the alloy that Rolex uses is so lovely, you know, and, and have that weight of a full precious metal bracelet. I think that would be fantastic. So one day I would like to own a precious metal watch and have some intrinsic value. And it's not just the demand of something desirable in stainless steel. I get that appeal. Christian says, it's a shame about the SPB 187. I was considering buying one. Seiko needs to step it up. Yeah, I agree with you. It is kind of a shame. It's a good watch, but it's expensive and you're definitely not getting the value for money that you once that you once got with Seiko. You know, you, you're getting what you pay for now. And even then you have to live with some warts, like a little bit of misalignment and, you know, a rattly ish bracelet, all that. So yeah, that's a good comment. Christian Al says, I bet you sell the VC this time next year. 
you know, who knows? I've got no plans on selling it anytime soon, but I'm sure at some point it will go and maybe it's to fund a precious metal watch or, or something. I don't know, <laughs> but no, I, I, hopefully I have it next year. I'm, I'm not planning on selling it that soon. I'm thinking like, I don't know, at least a few years out, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Giuseppe says, hi from Vancouver. Bruce, where did you get the Tsunavi wave print on the wall of your office? Thanks. Um, yeah, I got that on Amazon. I think it was like $40. You can choose from various sizes. And if I remember, I'll, I'll hunt it down and put the link in the description. I'll have to edit that in. But yeah, it's not very expensive and it's a fun print. So that, that's a good question. Okay, so let's get back to the let's get back to the the core collection. This is these three are my core. So I'm going to take the Seiko, move it off to the side, and focus in on my core. And let me tell you guys what I really like about this. And the first thing is I like the mix of color. I like the mix of different brands and different styles. So we have a black chronograph from Omega. We have a green dialed Submariner or a dive watch from Rolex, different style of bracelet, you know, different functions. And then we have such a lovely blue, one of the best blue dialed watches out there in the overseas, which is just a simple three hand with a date, you know, not a chronograph, not a dive watch. Essentially, the movements are very similar with the Rolex and the VC, but um, yeah, I love just how powerful this core is. And it's so nice to have different color, different functions. And when I add something else, I'd like to strengthen this core right here. So maybe something with a really killer white or silver dial. Um, I don't know, maybe something with a complication that I don't have. So uh, that, that's the core. Excuse me, I'm really happy with it. Blue Ram says, really a bulletproof trio there. I appreciate that. That's really nice. Rob says, possibly the most iconic three watch collection. Um, I really appreciate that. That's really kind of you. So let me run through a few different watches that I'm considering. And then I'll also talk about a watch that I've ordered, but it just hasn't come in yet. I hopefully, I had hoped that it would be here before I did this uh, live stream, but you know, it might happen this week. Um, I, I, what do you guys think about this? Putting in the Santos de Cartier or the Reverso from JLC in large with the white dial or the silver dial, I, I think about that and I see a possible four that is really great, a lot of history. With the Cartier, it would come with an amazing bracelet. And a bracelet is something that I really value. So um, that has that going for it. The Reverso, I think, is a little bit more iconic, but at least with the large, there is no bracelet available uh, currently. So I don't know. I, I, I doubt that the Reverso would stick around long term if it doesn't have a decent bracelet. But uh, Jeffrey says the VC is straight fire. Great collection. Thank you very much. Watches and Giggles recommends that I get the JLC. So does Michael Reverso. And Sean says, thoughts on the JLC Polaris? You know, um, I've, I've got so much sport right here. You know, a <laughs> couple divers, uh, an historic chronograph. Technically, this, you know, has 150 meters of water resistance. It's anti-magnetic. It's a pretty robust watch. I'd like something that has more of a dressy vibe to it. So when I go GLC, it's probably got to be uh, the Reverso or maybe a master, you know, a master series, maybe the moon phase, something very elegant and dressy. Hey, Rob, Rob is here. Rob, Random Rob says, hello. I hope you're enjoying your time in Florida right now, uh, soaking up the sun and maybe getting a vacation watch. That would be awesome. And Rob, I don't want to... Um, keep you here if you know you're hanging out with the family or, or you're doing something but if you want to get on i can send you a link and you're welcome to stream with me if you like so um michael says i saw a skeleton santos the other day it was pretty awesome i've only seen pictures of those and it looks so dang cool but man is it expensive it it basically has precious metal pricing associated with a stainless steel watch 
So I don't know, maybe uh, <laughs> if things change financially for me, that could be in the picture, but um, uh, that one's an expensive one, but yes, certainly very beautiful. Bulldog says, random Rob in the house. Now we've got a show going. Tennessee Mike says, Moser. Um, here's my, this is what I think about Moser. I'm impressed with what they do. I know they, they do fantastic dial work. But I have fantastic dial work with the VC right here. I have fantastic color play with this. I know it doesn't show up that well on the, you know, the live stream, but the blue is so electric. It borders on purple. And then in certain lights, it kind of looks black. And then in certain lights, you see the sun ray. And then in others, it just looks like it's lacquered. I don't know that I... I don't know that a Moser would bring more to the table than what I already have with the overseas. So that's my reservation with that, even though that, you know, that kind of sounds a little silly. David says, superb core collection. Bruce, I admire your focus. The Cartier would be a perfect fourth. Add some variety, but keep the we. We, is that what you meant to say? I don't know. <laughs> uh, good comment, David. So let me... Let me talk about, let me, let me share with you guys what I've ordered. So I talked to one of my friends that works at a local authorized dealer. Uh, he's a friend of mine. We go out to lunch every once in a while. Uh, I've been meaning to go fishing with him, but it never happened this summer. And I'm too much of a wimp to go <laughs> fishing in the wintertime here in Utah. But anyways, I asked him, hey, is it possible to get a Tudor Royal? And he said, what are you looking for? Are you looking for the blue? Because everybody is looking for the blue stainless steel. And I said, no, I'm, I'm looking for the two-tone. I like the way that fluted bezel that I believe is stamped now. Uh, I, I like the way that pops, how it makes the dial look a little bit smaller, uh, the thin profile, the integrated bracelet. I said, what about a two-tone? What can you do for me on that? And he said, let me check with my rep. And he said that the black dial was at least 14 weeks out when it comes to orders, but they had a silver dial, at least Tudor uh, USA had a silver dial in stock and a champagne dial in stock. And I don't want to spoil the surprise. Maybe that's a little silly, but I ordered one of those two, two-tone, either in silver or in champagne or a gold uh, essentially dial. And so hopefully that comes this week and I'm going to film a video going down to the authorized dealer making the purchase, and then uh, maybe doing an update, showing you the new Tudor next to you know the VC, the Hulk, and the Omega. And it would be here, and you know, the Seiko, I guess, can still be off to the side. But uh, I will have a day and a date complication in a more dressy-looking watch with an integrated bracelet, a nice bracelet. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, Let's see here. I have, I prepared something that I hope is a little helpful for some of you. So let me place the banner up on the screen. Let's talk about servicing costs and recommendations when it comes to, um, when it comes to these exact watches. So when it comes to a Seiko, and this is servicing costs from each one of these brands, it's not going to an independent watchmaker, which if you know a good one, that's usually the best way to go because you can save a little bit of money and it usually takes, uh, it's usually done a lot quicker than sending it off to Texas or New Jersey, back to Japan or Switzerland. So with Seiko, with a 6R movement, a full service will set you back $260, which isn't too bad, right? But when you consider this is roughly a $1,000 watch, 26% of the overall price for a service, oh, yeah, that's, I guess that's adequate. And Seiko recommends a service every three years, which I would say don't do. I would wait till it really starts getting erratic in the timekeeping or doesn't keep a very good power reserve. So um, I would go longer than three years, but that's what they recommend. And they say it would take five to eight weeks to complete the service. And uh, <laughs> it's never fun to be parted from a watch for over a month, maybe two months. So maybe guys, if, if you're in the chat and you've actually sent in a Seiko for servicing, Go ahead and shout out how long it took 
and how much you ended up spending, but uh, they say $260. Uh, let's talk about the Omega. Uh, the Omega will cost $750 because this is not a basic time-only movement. This is a chronograph, and this particular version is dressed up more so than the 1861 when it comes to the finish work and the rhodium plating, uh, the metallic break. So it's a bit more involved. And Omega recommends every four to five years to get the service. And they also say four to eight weeks turnaround time when it comes to uh, the Omega. So it's kind of an expensive service. Um, this is worth roughly, I think in its current condition, about $4,000 right now. And that seems to be kind of in line percentage wise with the Seiko. You're still spending a good chunk, over 20% of the overall value in the service, uh, but they recommend every four to five years. And you can go longer if you have a um, a coaxial movement, excuse me, um, one of like the 8,800, 8,900, those can go longer. You can likely go closer to a decade between servicing. But we have a comment here from Henry who said, I sent a Seiko a vintage Seiko, $180 service, had it back in four weeks, and I was in Pennsylvania, sent it to New Jersey. So that, that's a good one. Daniel says, I sent the New Jersey Center my 7S26 in February. I didn't get it back until June. That's four months. Dang, that is quite a while for such a basic movement that you probably could have bought it, <laughs> bought one and, and dropped it in yourself. Wow. Uh, let's continue with the surfacing, guys, if you don't mind. Let's talk about Rolex. This one, Rolex doesn't advertise a specific... Oh, you know what? My phone just died. That's a little bit embarrassing. Let's see how long we, we have the video before that, sh <laughs> before that shuts off. So uh, the Rolex... I th okay, it's... Okay, it's just going to be... Okay, we've lost video. We just have the screen. So, you know what? Let's go back to my ugly mug. Excuse me. Um, like this. There we go. So the Rolex, they don't have any specific pricing because it depends on what you do. It depends on what they replace in the movement. But a ballpark figure is anywhere from $600 to $800. But they recommend only every decade to do the service. So you certainly could do it faster than that. Like if you want to do it every five years, you could do that. But they said, don't let it go longer than a decade. So I, I like that. The fact that I'm spending probably $800 every 10 years on a watch that generally costs seven, eight, $10,000. Um, that's not terrible. It's a smaller percentage of the overall cost of the watch in a less frequent time. And they say every four to six, or sorry, they say four to six weeks it will take to get your, your watch back from um, the service center in Dallas, Texas. Um, Random Rob says service costs on a G-Shock, zero. <laughs> I like the way you think, man. I like the way you think. Uh, Mr. TW says, Jade Green Sumo, 6R35, warranty service, Sydney, Australia, back within four weeks, great service. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Um, John, excuse me, John says service costs are all part of keeping a luxury timepiece running right, so not an unexpected expense. I spent $580 on a vintage Omega service. I agree with you 100%. Every time you buy a watch, you know, even if you're a flipper, you're committing yourself to upkeep that watch for the life that you have it. And, you know, if you keep it five years, if you keep it a decade, yeah, you need to, you need to factor in the service costs. I definitely agree with that. That's a, that's a great comment. Leon says your VC is just unbelievable. I was at the AD lately and they had the blue 5,500 V and it blew me away. I, I wish my, my, I would have, if I would have prepped better, had more battery in the, in the phone, I could show you a little bit better, but yeah, this blue is just outstanding. It really is. It, it's something else. So um, let's talk about servicing costs for the Vacheron Constantin Overseas 4500V. I went to their website and they said for this particular movement that I have that doesn't have a complication, it's, it's just time and a date, it would cost 750 
which I thought was really reasonable. I was expecting something that was closer to a thousand, maybe a little bit over a thousand. And they recommend uh, every four to five years to get the service. You could probably go a little bit longer than that. I think what I'll do if I have it in five years, I don't know if I'll have it in five years, but in five years after, after I purchased it, then I would get the service and, you know, spend that $750 and they say, we'll take four weeks. So I think I could live without it for a month. Um, I think I, I could do it without a month. So I saw a question here, man, the chat is going faster than I can keep up with it. Alvaro says, did you already show your collection? Yes. I'm sorry. I had a split screen here, but my, my secondary device died. So <laughs> you'll have to bear with me here. Uh, Apologize on that. What is my favorite watch from NGC? Let me pull it up. Can you guys guess? Of course it's the VC. This is my favorite piece here. Let me see if I can get it to focus. It might not. Oh, there we go. So this is my favorite piece. It's such a joy to wear. It's a great size. It's thin. It's comfortable. The finishing is next level. The movement is out of this world. Beautiful. That's my favorite piece. But um, if I could only choose one to keep and use every day, I think the best daily driver, at least in my current collection, is the Hulk. I mean, this thing is also thin and comfortable and beautiful, waterproof, adjustable when it comes to the bracelet. Uh, this thing is super hard to beat as a daily driver. So I would say, you know, for a practical choice, it would have to be the sub, but if it's my absolute favorite, it's got to be this one. Yeah, it's just such a lovely, such a lovely watch. Which one do I wear the most is, I would say probably the Omega, the Sapphire Sandwich. Let's see if we can get this to focus. There we go. I love this design. Uh, this does have a very beautiful movement. I don't know if you, can, you guys can see that. Oh, there we go. It's got a beautiful movement. It's a hand wind piece, not the most accurate. In fact, it's probably my least accurate, even less accurate than my basic 6R35 that's in the SPB187. Um, but yeah, I probably wear this the most. It's the most conservative. It goes with everything. It's really comfortable. And Omega has got to be my favorite brand right now. So um, let me highlight a few comments here. Excuse me. Random Rob says, watch spotting on Longboat Key, mostly Apple Watch, some Panerai and Rolex. Also did spot one Oris Aquas on a young man. That's cool, man. And I'm assuming you took your Seamaster, your Orange Monster, probably at least a G-Shock, and I don't know what else. What are you wearing the most, Robert? I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you're uh, rocking uh, in the Keys of Florida. Coast Life says, Bruce, did you sell your GMT Master 2? I did. Um, I, I did. And I let go of some really awesome watches that from time to time I miss. And I go, that was a dumb choice, Bruce. You shouldn't have sold that watch. <laughs> you shouldn't have done it. But you know what? It was all, let me tell you why, actually. Let me tell you why. One was I wanted to responsibly buy this Grail watch that cost roughly $20,000 and I think my collection before I bought this was worth around 30000 And I didn't want to have a $50,000 watch collection and having really nice watches sitting in the box because I only wear one watch at a time. And most likely I would be wearing, you know, this and, and a couple other pieces. So I made the hard choice and probably the dumb choice to sell the GMT Master 2. I sold the Seamaster. I sold my Air King. So I really enjoyed, you know, having this big old budget, you know, and the and for the watch fund. I really enjoyed getting the grail. And I really enjoyed, well, I currently am enjoying a lovely small collection where no watch sits for more than a couple days. It all gets worn, it all gets enjoyed. And for me, for my personality, it's just working really well. So uh, yeah, the GMT Master 2 was sacrificed and Funny story on that, I had a viewer email me and say, hey, Bruce, because of your GMT Master 2 video, I decided I really needed one. So I went out and bought one. It arrived in the mail because he bought it from a dealer. 
and he opened up the warranty card and it was my watch. And he sent me a picture of my name that I had signed at the City Creek Boutique here in Utah. And so he, he thought that was pretty funny. I thought that was pretty funny too. So yes, the GMT Master 2 is, as Michael says, long gone. Yeah, I did sacrifice that. Um, Rob is wearing the Seamaster. Excellent. That's excellent. Tabasco says, how come no one likes the Victorinox Air Boss? Um, I'm having a hard time even remembering what the Air Boss looks like. <laughs> but I, I think it's a mechanical watch with a 2892 in it or a 2824, and I'm guessing around $600. Maybe it comes down to just nobody knows about it. I don't know, because technically the specs should be all right, right? Rob says, pretty spot on for what I took too. Yeah, because I guess the G-Shock, the Monster, and the uh, Seamaster, and what else would you need? I mean, that's a heck of a three-piece collection right there. Jack Chen says, oh, excuse me, wrong comment. I'm selling my 8,500 Aquaterra. That seems like an awfully low price for an 8,500 Aquaterra. Awfully low price. So guys, if you have any questions, uh, let me know in the chat. I'm happy to take some more. Bruce Hulks looks like it has a black dial. Yeah, let me pull that up. It does. And a lot of lights, let me see if I can get the right angle here. Doesn't that kind of look like a Kermit, you know, a black dial, green bezel, and then I get it in the right light, and you really see the green sun ray. Oh, it's a beauty. This is a beauty. I do enjoy it more than the new ceramic Kermit. And here's another opinion, guys. Um, I will always want to have a Rolex in the collection. The most I ever had it at one time was three. And that was, you know, really enjoyable. But there's something that kind of pained me about seeing two sit in the watch box at any given day or in the safe. And so I always want to have one. And I'm assuming at some point I'll move on from this Hulk. Um, or maybe I just add another Rolex and I learn to live with <laughs> you know, having something sit and not freak out about it. And I know that's something wrong with me. It's a first world problem, but there is a Rolex that I would really love to add. And I, excuse me, if you can hear my seven year old jumping up and down, right, right above the room that I'm filming in. Um, and that is the oyster perpetual and 41 with that gorgeous turquoise blue. As you guys know, as you saw earlier on in the stream, a love color, <laughs> love, a bold color that's done really well. And I think that would be a very, very fun addition to wear, you know, time only, no date, very simple, all brush bracelet. That's one that I saw when it first came into my authorized dealer. I saw all the colors, uh, except for the blue color. They didn't get that one in at the time, but uh, Rolex did a great job with those new Oyster Perpetual releases. Amit says, having more than two watches stresses me out. So you kind of get where I'm coming from. You like to wear your watches very frequently. You're paying attention to each of them. None of them are sitting. I, obviously, I have more than two, but I like to keep it minimal. Right now, I have four. I've got one inbound that will take me to five, and I'll probably get rid of the Seiko um, sometime within the next six months. So, yeah, that's a good comment. Let me change the banner here. Answering chat questions and comments. So guys, if you have a question or a comment you want to talk about, let's do it here uh, for a little bit longer. Jack says, if you were to keep one of your watches in your current collection, which would it be? I kind of answered that a little bit earlier. I think this is the most practical watch to wear on an everyday basis. It's so comfortable. It's unbeatable. You know, it's my most accurate watch out of all of my watches easily. That's what it would be, but it's not my favorite. This one is my favorite. Just love the VC. So let's let's take a couple more. Chris says, hey, Bruce, just checking in before heading out to work for the night, wearing the all-metal G-Shock square, of course. That's awesome, Chris. Chris is just such a good dude, and I hope you have a good evening at work. I know you uh, you work nights, and, um, man, that's, that's tough. I admire you. You're a good guy. You got a great watch on rest on wrist this evening. Bulldog says, have I ever met Archie Luxury? No, I have not. If 
I ever make it down to Australia, though, I'd love to meet him, have lunch with him. Um, I, I'd recognize Paul plays a character. So I'd, I'd want to meet the, the person behind the character, you know, a fellow content creator on YouTube. But I'd, I'd love to meet a ton of people that create content, not just watch channels too, but other, you know, the other interests that I have. I, I love meeting people, getting to know people. Um, even though I'm a little bit of an introvert, I'm learning to kind of get out of my shell, you know, especially over the past uh, past a little while. Jay says, stop apologizing for the kids. We can never hear what's going on in the background anyways. Well, that's good to know because I swear they, it sounds like they've put wooden clogs on and they're like jumping or, or uh, bowling or something. It, it, it sounds really big here in the room, but I'm glad, I'm glad that the microphone's filter, filtering out that. Um, Chris says, thanks. Appreciate it. Giuseppe says, my goal is to have four or five core watches. Others would be beater watches. I like this idea. You know, right now I have four, one inbound, you know, have a small, great, powerful core, and then have some like just a fun segment where, you know, you're, you're just having fun. It's not a keeper. Maybe it's kind of outrageous. <laughs> Maybe it's a wild card piece. Maybe it's something, you know, you just want to try, but you're going to catch and release, you know, being able to cycle through and chase after the latest interest, even if it's temporary, I think that's kind of a good way to go about enjoying the hobby. Paulo says, Snoopy 2020, what do you think? I think that is a dang cool watch. I've not seen it in person. It is gimmicky for sure, but I love the color scheme. I love, you know, being able to turn it around and see Snoopy go around the backside of the moon and see the earth rotate. I'm fascinated by space and space history. I love the Speedmaster. So I recognize it's an overpriced, hard to get watch, very gimmicky, very silly, but I still like it myself. Mr. Perpetual says he's having lunch on you, nothing with him. I'm not sure what that means. Okay, what do we got here? Is your Hulk discontinued? That's from Ant G. It is. Uh, when Rolex updated the Submariner earlier on this year in, in the fall, they, or I guess it was the, the summertime officially, they made a few changes. You can't really see the changes. The case is just a little bit wider. The lugs have a more slender look because the bracelet, the lug width is a little bit wider as well. There are just a few small, subtle differences aesthetically, and then it gets it gets the new caliber, the thirty one, sorry, the thirty two thirty five. Mine has the thirty one thirty five. So there are a few differences, and this officially is discontinued and is no longer available. You might find the odd authorized dealer around the country that has maybe kept a couple back in the safe, you know, for good clients that come back looking for a watch they missed out on but I think that would be the exception rather than the rule. So yes, my hoax discontinued, but so is the no date, the 114060 and the basic black Submariner. In fact, all of the, the previous generation maxi cases have been updated. Nelson says, I use my Omega Seamaster ceramic wave dial as my beater daily. What's yours? Uh, that's a great beater. That's a great daily wear watch. And I wore mine a ton when I had the Chrome dial version and I, I put some nice little scratches in that adjustable clasp and bracelet. Uh, that one, yeah, that's that's a great daily. I would say the one I wear most is probably the Speedmaster. It's just such an easy watch to grab and take. It's not the most accurate, but it, it's it's the most conservative. It goes with everything, and I really enjoy wearing it. Second place, it's hard to say. I mean, these they all get worn frequently, but probably this, and then probably this. I like to save the overseas for nice occasions. You know, I take my wife out on a date or we go as a family out to dinner or something. Um, more nice occasions I'll, <laughs> I'll throw on the overseas. Frankenbone says, would you rather wear a paddock Calatrava leather strap watch or a platinum day date with a suit for a formal party? Well, you know what? I'm not invited to many formal parties and I would assume if I were to go, I don't know how strict the rules would be when it comes to, or at least the unwritten rules when it comes to attire 
and what's appropriate, right? The, the most acceptable answer, I think, would be the paddock on the leather, under the radar, thin, elegant, and beautiful. But man, the Platinum Day Date, that is such a hefty watch in that ice blue or whatever they call it, glacier blue. It's such an eye grabber. I'd probably want to go a little bit more ostentatious and wear the Platinum Day Date, but you know, I don't know. I'm kind of a casual guy. I dress like a bum most days, you know, shorts and a t-shirt. So I'm, I'm not going to be attending any formal parties in the near future. Les says, what do you think of Mark's Islander brand? That's a good question. I think those watches carry some real value. Like he's taking what people love about Seiko, the SKX and a couple other uh, brands. I think he's doing like a date just version pretty soon. So he's taking iconic designs from other brands and he's coming at them at a lower price point or at least an affordable price point, but you're getting Sapphire, you're getting good loom, you're getting nice details. So by that respect, I think they have really good value. I can see the allure there, but personally, I'm, I'm not interested in someone else's IP, someone else's design, you know, especially I, I think it comes down to the fact that I work in design and I, I went to architecture school. So I might feel a little bit differently than the average person, but I, I wouldn't buy one, even though they have great specs, just for the simple fact that they're not original. Um, originality is a big sticking point for me personally, though I recognize that's not a big sticking point for other people. Han says, hi, Bruce, a very enjoyable show, mate. Congrats. I appreciate it. And I see you have a Hulk in your, your profile picture there. So that's awesome. Just the watch. Glad to see you're here. You're becoming a real favorite. Do we have a couple other channels in here? I know Robert was in for a minute. Um, Welcome here. <laughs> Welcome if, if you're tuning in. Kevin says, when are you selling the overseas? Anytime soon? No, not anytime soon. Maybe, maybe in a few years, but no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not planning on selling it anytime soon. Okay. What is the next Omega you are looking to get? It's a good question. I really like the Aquaterra. I really was intrigued by that new 41 millimeter constellation that I reviewed with the silver texture dial. I think that on a bracelet would be really fun. But um, I, I think for me, and I touched on this earlier, I, I recognize not everybody stays for the, for the entire duration of the stream and that's totally okay. But for me, I want a diver from Omega and I really want to get either the white dial planet ocean with the blood orange ceramic loomed bezel. That thing is just such a cool watch, such a cool watch. Um, I either want to get that or a rumored update of the Seamaster 300, which is not the Seamaster professional with the, with the wave dial. This is the more vintage inspired Seamaster 300. I've seen some information that an update is coming this year. And uh, if it turns out to be true, I probably want to get that or the planet ocean myself. But man, Omega, there's so many good ones. So many good ones. Beto says, hey, Bruce, this year add two watches that are, are the most important in my collection, and a Speedmaster Hesselite and a Tudor Black Bay Burgundy. What do you think of them? I like them. I've owned both of those watches in years past. And you've got a great diver, no date, and then you have arguably the most iconic chronograph that is debated, obviously, but it's a lovely design. I think you've got a great one-two punch. So well done. Bond Pitt says, agreed on your opinion of Islander watch is not original. Yeah, I mean, I think the specs look awesome. The value is there. I just can't get behind something that's that's not original. But that brings up another point that I've talked about with Robert, who says, I bet it's gone by June. <laughs> you're, such, you're such a guy, Robert. Uh, I've talked about this with Robert because we complain as watch enthusiasts about micro brands not coming out with original stuff, right? Everybody's doing Submariner homages or in, in Islander's case, Seiko homages. And there's very few brands that are coming out with original stuff. But once a brand does something original, like the Steinhardt Ocean 2, right, that looks nothing like a Submariner, nobody buys it. <laughs> uh, and so I think the watch market, 
there's a thirst for homage watches and there are very few brands, at least micro brands that are doing original stuff that's value rich. And that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy Zelos. I've really enjoyed the notice that I reviewed recently. I enjoy Brellum. I know that's a higher price segment, but uh, really good original stuff that, that's value rich. So here, let me, let me try to keep up with the chat here. Let, let's, let's do this for a few more minutes. I want to be respectful of your guys's time. I know it's a Sunday evening, the weekend's winding down. Um, Blue Ram says, I really like the black and white bezel Omega Planet Ocean GMT. Man, I'm with you. Omega, they make such enjoyable watches. You know, I love the fact that you can see the movement, the meta certified movement through an exhibition case back. You get adjustable bracelets, you get nice presentation boxes, great anti reflective treatment. There's so much to love about Omega. And that's, you know, why it dethroned Seiko, which has kind of been going down in overall quality and brand perception. And that's why I love Omega. There's so many good ones. So many good ones. So, um, Bobby Smith is tuning out. Good night, all. Thanks for being here, Bobby. Have a good evening. Treat it says, I'm new into watches. I got my first automatic watch in March and I paid $380 for it. It was awesome to see a double in price, but it's annoying. People always say, oh, it's just a Seiko. What's your thoughts? Uh, so I don't know. Let me share with you my opinion. Here's my one, one uh, Seiko wristwatch. This is the SPB 187. I showed this a little bit earlier, but here's my awesome Seiko Quartz desk clock. I love Seiko. And it, it's kind of fun to get an expensive Seiko, you know, like a Grand Seiko or a Marine Master where you're spending, you know, $1,500, $2,000, $3,000, depending on the model. And you have just a Seiko. And people will compliment you. Like when I, I've owned Grand Seiko and I've had nice, I've had four Marine Masters over the years and I usually get compliments like, oh, that's a cool watch. Oh, that's a pretty looking watch. Where'd you get that watch? Oh, what's that called? And nobody knows that they caused ridiculous amounts of money for just a Seiko. And I kind of like the fact that it's under the radar. You know, you know what you have, but only another kind of watch enthusiast will get the behind the scenes joke, I guess, of just having a Seiko. So I don't know. I think that's a good comment treated. Steven likes the heritage line from Longines. I agree. I think there's a chronograph out, the tuxedo chronograph, very vintage inspired. I forget what reference it's paying homage to, but the heritage line seems to be the only thing keeping Longines in business right now. They're they're doing well with the Heritage line, and it doesn't seem like they're doing well with many of their other lines, and I like the Heritage line quite a bit. Christian says, so many homages out there. I like to see original originality with Zelos, Stratton, Signum, and Brellum. I'm right there with you, Christian. Absolutely. Right there with you. Jeffrey says, Orient is the new Seiko. I'd agree with that. I would agree with that. Um <sighs> Almost, almost. I would agree with that to a degree because Orient, they don't have the scope of selection. They don't have the breadth of selection too. Like when it comes to price, when I was getting into Seiko, you could get a $200 Monster Gen 2 and you could buy an $1,800 Marine Master. And there was stuff in between with the Sumo and the Shogun and the Tuna. With Orient, it's... <sighs> I don't think they do much over $600 anymore. The Saturation Diver, which was such a great watch. It's one that I've tr tried and flipped and enjoyed. They stopped making that a couple years ago. So I think they're the new Seiko in, in the fact that they bring the value, but there's not a ton of selection in price or models. So hopefully that expands. And funnily enough, the profits are all going back to the Seiko Epson Corporation. So if, if Orient becomes the new Seiko, I'm sure they don't care, right? The, the, the owning brand doesn't care there. Jack says, do you think the King Seikos will be collectible? Yes, but not to the degree that vintage Grand Seikos are. For whatever reason, people gravitate toward Grand Seiko, even though at the time, you know, decades ago, they were kind of um, in competition there. So yeah, it'll be collectible, but just not to the same degree. That's my opinion. I could be wrong there for sure. 
Phil says, Bruce, I noticed you put out a lot more content than other watch channels. How do you do it? Um, well, I, thank you. I appreciate that. And I like your Explorer in the picture that you have, Phil, and watches. So I've kind of streamlined what I do. And when I get a couple watches in for review, I'll sit down and I can do macro video on three watches at the same time. I can go outside, get my wrist rolls and outside shots in natural light, you know, three or four at a time. And then I have, you're, you're seeing the ugly part of my office, but I have my own space here. It's well lit. I have a beautiful desk in front of me. Um, I, I have the space to record. So my girls go to bed at night. I can come down, record a few videos, um, use the footage that I've gotten of the macro shots and the outside shots. I've got it all separated, organized in folders. And then on, on another day, I can sit down and edit a couple videos. And, you know, I just slowly build up what I've, you know, what I've been doing. Live streams are really easy because I can sit down and, and hit go. And <laughs> that's, that's one video. So I'm trying to bust out daily content. I've been doing that since I think mid-October. And then in January, I'm going to take a little break. I'll still be doing maybe every couple days, but I'm not going to do every day um, for the simple fact. And you, you'll you probably notice this with other channels. A lot of YouTubers take a break in January because even if your views are up, if your watch time is up, if your clicks are up, you know, all of the statistics, advertisers they half what they were paying the previous month, like December, November, that's the heyday for advertisers. So I'm trying to capitalize on that, you know, busting out daily videos and getting more ad revenue. Uh, but in, in January, it doesn't matter. Even if your views are up, Google ad revenue just basically drops by half. So um, just a little bit behind the scenes there. I appreciate the nice comment. Yeah. Rob says January slows down. That's for sure. John says, what are your thoughts on the Prospects Alpinist inspired watch versus the original Alpinist? I like the original. I don't use the compass ring. I've owned the green and I've owned the blue dial Houdinki version. Um, I, I, I don't have anything against the new Prospects Alpinist. I just like the sun ray as opposed to kind of the gritty fume texture of the new Prospects Alpinist. But that's, you know, just personal preference. Tom, I... Is that a porcupine or a squirrel? <laughs> oh, it's the head, the hair. Yeah, man. Check that out. I could spike you with that right there. You know, I, I adopted this hairstyle 2008, I think. So it's been about 12 years. And my, my mother-in-law met me for the first time. She didn't like me because I look like a tool because of my stupid hair. <laughs> so she got over it eventually. And one time she had younger kids. My wife had younger siblings and I styled her eight-year-old's hair all pointy and he comes running out and uh, everyone's laughing and he's like, mom, look at my hair. Bruce did it. And she goes, that's not funny. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate the, the compliment or maybe not, and maybe it's not a compliment, but yeah, it's my, it's my style, my style, Robert 499, dude. Thank you. You're a good dude. You didn't need to do that. So Thanks very, very much. Appreciate it. Han says, how accurate is the VC in seconds per day? Well, I threw it on the time grapher and it was like plus two seconds per day. It's not a hacking movement. So I, you know, I'm not fussed with accuracy. I know it's just spot on. And then every, you know, two, three weeks, I'll adjust the time and make sure it's, you know, it's perfect and it's not off by, you know, 20, 30 seconds, but it is very, very well dialed in. It's hand finished, it's hand regulated in multiple positions. And if you spend, you know, 10 minutes on Google, look up the hallmark of Geneva, all of the specifications involved for getting that seal on the movement, there's a lot of them. So um, I know you're not technically getting a COSC watch, you're actually getting a nicer watch. Um, so it's very, very accurate. Ray says, what manufacturer outside your current collection would you want to collaborate with? Well, that eliminates Seiko and Omega, VC and Rolex. Um, hmm, man, that's a good question. Not one that I've thought of before, Ray. Huh. I'd have to say I'd probably go with Zenith or JLC. And I'd go back into their history 
and look at something awesome and obscure. Uh, such a cool watch, either from the DeFi line, uh, the DeFi line, or I don't know, maybe even from the the pre Jaeger days with JLC, and just kind of redo something with a modern twist from one of those brands. I think that would be, I think that would be pretty cool. You can PayPal it back to me. Dude, I've got you. You know what? Next time you stream, you're going to get a $4.99 super chat from me. We'll just play this game where we pass it back and forth. How about that? <laughs> uh, Han says, not bad. Can you regulate by crown position at night? Uh, yeah, but I I don't go to that um, to that level. Um, you know, that, It's so accurate that I'm not too bothered by it. Malkin Malone laughs. So yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to do that, Robert. We're just going to be PayPaling each other here in the super chats for sure. Uh, here, here's a good question here from Kurt. Coming back to this question, as I know you've had a lot, what do you think of the GP Laureato 41 gray dial? Would you go for gray or blue dial in that watch? Ooh, I like that question. So I've reviewed the 41 millimeter gray dial and I would say go with that one because blue is kind of like the thing right now. It's and it's almost overplayed, right? Everybody wants to do the integrated style bracelet, steel sports model in blue. So I'd say go gray, and I think it's a great watch. I was going to buy it. The one that I reviewed, I, I started flipping watches in my collection to buy it, and then a viewer snagged it before I was financially ready to do it which is fine because I think a month later I, I bought the Air King with the funds anyway. So I, I was happy, but yeah, I think that's a great question. Les Baker. Hey, no comment, just a tip, a super chat of four ninety nine. dollars I appreciate that. And Rob says, you rock less. Les, do you have a channel? Because maybe we can do like this, uh, this back and forth, you live stream and I, I super chat you and then Rob does it. I, and we just, you know, play this silly merry-go-round game. <laughs> hey, but thank you very much for the super chat. That was super, uh, super kind of you. Han says, my VC uh, uh, OS Gen 2 is five seconds plus. Okay. Yeah, that, that might bother me. I mean, we're talking about just a few seconds. It's not all that much in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, you go two weeks and it's it's not that accurate, I guess, after a while. And <laughs> Malcolm Malone, same thing. Hey, what is the deal? Did Robert tell you guys to super chat without saying anything? It, I bet I maybe that's what he did. Robert is just being classic random Rob. But hey, dude, thank you very much for the chat. I mean, that's awesome. And Rob says, you rock less. Oh, I already did that one. Rob, you need to say, you rock, you rock Malcolm Malone. <laughs> JT says Tudor Royal Clasp is a disaster. I've heard that. I've heard that you can kind of pull them apart because uh, it has a small flip lock and then it's a ceramic ceramic ball bearing detent system that keeps it together via friction. So I'll report on mine when I get it, hopefully this week, how it is. You know, if, it, if it's going to pop with just, a, you know, moving your wrist and it, it, it comes off, that would definitely be a disaster. So I'll let you guys know how I get on with mine. Um, definitely. John says, Bruce, would you consider something German for your next item? Nomos, Glashuta Original, Alanga Unsona, Junghans. Um, yeah, I would. I really enjoyed the Nomos Club Sport Neomatic. I sold that to my friend Homer, who streamed with me last week. And that one was a really nice Nomos. Um, I might I might be open to a rebuy on that one. Um, Glashuta Original, I would love a 70s. Such a cool design. So quirky. I, I like it. Obviously, my style is awesome with my hair and my casual attire. So obviously, I would go with a German. Very nice uh, glass huta. But yeah, I, I'd, lo I'd love to try a Longa one day. And I'm most intrigued by the Longa one, the classic. Dirk. Nine, nine, you know, I got to step it up a little. <laughs> Hey, at least you commented. You you said something. Everybody else, like Jay Bradley, no comment. You know, I I bet you Robert sent a text out or in his uh, Discord. <laughs> you guys are funny, but I appreciate it. Really, I do. And Jeffrey getting in on the action. Rob sent me. Just kidding. 
Oh man, you guys, you guys, Jay Bradley, you rock. You guys are, you guys are awesome. You're making my, my evening here. Let's do a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Tony or Tom says, uh, do you prefer the date or the no date sub? I prefer the original Submariner, which is no date. Uh, the 114060, which is now discontinued. So symmetrical, so lovely. That's what I prefer. And it's a little bit more affordable um, than the date version. Han says, do you miss the Santos? Yes, but the 100 XL that I owned was just too big, too hefty, too solid, too awesome for such an elegant historic design. So I'd like to go with the Santos de Cartier or the uh, the the Dumont, the new Dumont that um, doesn't have a bracelet, but really awesome. Rob says Dirk with the boss move. You guys, you guys are you guys crack me up. Rob says I said nothing. Legit man. <laughs> Malkin says Dirk just big leagued us. Mark, oh we hang on a sec. Ray, can you put towards a manicure for Rob? Yes, I will. Um, <laughs> I will do that. Rob thinks that's funny too. Okay, let's thank you guys. Thank you very much for the tips. Bruce, have you ever reviewed a Creedor and what would be a good used one be in a, uh, sorry, and, and would a good used one be a decent collectible? No, no to both. I've never reviewed one. It depends. It's subjective what you mean by decent collectible, but um, I think most people in the hobby, they place a lot of emphasis on the brand name and Creedor, people only know it that are crazy watch enthusiasts or maybe are local to the region in Japan. It's such an unheralded brand. So technically it's stealth wealth. I mean, it would, I guess it would be a decent collectible, but I think you could, you could spend similar money and it, you would get in the eyes of other watch enthusiasts, which is sounds silly to say you could get something more collectible if that makes sense. Rob says, I do need one. Well, you know what? Your, your hands are getting some Florida sun, some humidity. Maybe they'll be less, you know, cracked and worn when you get back to frigid Michigan. Uh, Kevin kind of agrees with me. Creedor is not collectible. Okay, let's do this one last question here, guys. I want to be respectful of your time. Christian says, has anyone experienced issues with the Longines Navigation Big Eye? I had one. I had to return it due to it not resetting to zero properly. So I owned this watch, Christian, and I didn't have a problem with that. I have had a problem with a chronograph, um, but it was a Luminox. It was a quartz in that one. Uh, it would reset, but it would reset to like five and not the zero or the 12 o'clock index. So I'm glad you returned yours. Um, I And I've, I've had issues with Longines, but I purchased them in my early days from the gray market and I never do that anymore. I, I don't trust the gray market. So did you get your navigation from the gray market, Christian? Maybe that could be something, maybe you got a bad batch or it was a refurb, you know, return or something. I don't know. Um, but I'm glad you got it returned because you definitely don't have to live with anything. And if you bought it at an authorized dealer, they should have fixed that under warranty. Absolutely. That is a problem. Sorry, I guess I said one more, but let's do one last one here. We kind of went off the rails. I was meaning to do a collection review, state of the collection, but my camera died. I have my phone all set up <laughs> as the secondary device. But uh, Galaga says, Bruce, are you now a less of a Seiko fan? It appears so. I think they have lost their charm. I am less of a Seiko fan. Uh, you, you've picked up on that correctly. I've got a video coming out tomorrow a review of the SPB 187 where I talk kind of specifically about that, how I still enjoy the watch, but it's definitely not the brand that it once was. It has flaws and faults and, and warts as I call it in the video. And I would agree, they have lost a big part of their charm. So guys, thank you so much for being here tonight. 200 of you right now. Thanks for all the, the, <laughs> the tips, the super chats, really kind of you. You guys cracked me up. You made my evening. Hope you have a great evening. Hope you have a great new year and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks guys.